Well, good morning, church family. It is good to be able to sing with you, and especially to sing, as I trust you were able to pick up the theme of the Lord's coming, as we are seeking to set our eyes on things above, not on this earth, to set our mind on the things where Christ is, and to pray, your kingdom come, and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If you would, take your Bibles, and we're going to continue our exposition through Mark's gospel, and we find ourselves concluding uh, Mark chapter 13 and the Olivet Discourse. And we're going to be looking at verses 24 through 37. If you didn't bring a Bible with you, we have pew Bibles there in front of you, and you can turn to page 798. And that will get you to our text. Mark chapter 13, and I invite you to follow along with me as I read the word of the living God for us this morning. Jesus said, but in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. Let's pray that we stay awake. Heavenly Father, we come to you and we cannot heed the words of this text apart from your Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, we ask that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to receive your word for us this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Several years ago, there was a particular TV show, I think it was on the History Channel, but it was called Doomsday Preppers. I don't know if any of you watched that and getting a couple of heads nodding. If you weren't familiar with the show, essentially this was the premise. Each episode focused on a family that was prepping for the end of the world. Uh, They might be prepping for a nuclear disaster. It could be environmental or economic. Uh, But whatever the case was, uh, the, the, the episode would take you through this family's preparations. And many times they They had a bunker, or they had a uh, hidden house somewhere in the mountains, or they had uh, dug out a a place in their basement, and you could see their cache of weapons and ammo, uh, their reserves for food and water, and even their sophisticated water and air filtration systems. And by the end of the episode, um, there was some measurements that were supposedly going to be taken and they would give them grades on every element that they needed to take account of and and areas that they might need to improve if they are going to survive the end of the world. 
This morning, Jesus calls us to be ready. To be ready for the coming of his return and the end of the age. But our readiness is not to be like that of the doomsday preppers who are merely storing up treasure on earth. Rather, the way we prep for doomsday, the coming day of the Lord, is by standing firm upon the gospel and remaining faithful to what Christ has called us to do as we await the great day of wrath that is coming upon the world. But for us, that day will be the day of our redemption. And so, indeed, this will be a great and terrible day. It is a day in which Jesus says here in verse 24 will happen after the coming tribulation. And so where I want us to begin is to see what makes this day great. The day of the Lord is great. And we see this in verses 24 through 27. And in fact, I've kind of got three sub points under this one. The day of the Lord is great because it is going to be a day of recompense. It's going to be a day of revelation. And it is going to be a day of restoration. Jesus says that at the end of the tribulation, we see here that the earth will give way, the heavens will be shaken, and the sun and the moon will be darkened. In other words, there will be no more light in the sky. The stars of the heaven will fall. And as we read these verses, these come straight out of the prophets, come straight out of Isaiah 13, 10 through 13. You could mark that, or or as Pastor Eric read for us, Joel chapter 2, verse 10. And these texts, in their context, anticipated coming judgments. In Isaiah, this was spoken of the judgment that would come upon Babylon, the, the nation that had Uh, enslaved or would enslave the people of God. Joel looks forward to the day in which all the nations will be judged, even Israel. Joel speaks of that day being great and terrible. As with Isaiah and Joel, those prophets, Jesus is coming to us. He is our prophet. He is our priest and our king. And, And you could say he has the prophet hat on right now. And just as the prophecies of old had both a near fulfillment and a far fulfillment, I believe that's what's been going on here. And if you've been with us over the last couple of weeks, I've been making that case. Judgment did come upon Israel through the Roman Empire, who burned the city to the ground, destroyed the temple, and slaughtered hundreds of thousands of people in AD 70. But this language of the heavens and the earth giving way also anticipates that climactic event of the day of the Lord when Jesus returns to judge. In its fullness, the day of the Lord will be the complete undoing of creation. And with this undoing and this language of cosmic upheaval, it is also a, a day of great judgment. I want you to hear how the Apostle Peter reminds the churches of these truths in 2 Peter 3. He says this, The day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. What is he saying here? What's he saying is that when Christ comes, friends, it won't matter if you've got a bunker or if you've got a house hidden in the mountains or even if you can go with Elon Musk to Mars. It will not matter. The heavens and the earth will be exposed. There will be no place to hide, nowhere to go. All that you have done and all that you are will be laid bare when he returns. There's going to be no place to hide. The very fabric of the universe is going to rip as Jesus Christ in all his glory invades space and time. It's going to be total upheaval. 
This language of darkness and the earth, the earth and the heavens shaking is also reminiscent to another time when the glory of the Lord descended upon the earth. Think all the way back to the Exodus and, and upon Mount Sinai when the glory of the Lord descended and his presence, if you remember, was accompanied by darkness, quaking, thunder, and lightning. And just as it was when the Lord descended upon that mountain and that location, so when the glory of Christ descends upon the whole earth, it will be a great earthquake. An earthquake so massive that it shakes the very foundations of the whole earth. The sky will vanish, as John says. It will roll up like a scroll in every mountain, in every island. It will just flutter and it will flee in his presence. And so for those who belong to this earth, those who have taken their lot with this world and who have not submitted to Christ's lordship by faith, this will be a day of great wrath, a day of great mourning, a, a day of great destruction. We read in the book of Revelation that the kings and the rulers of the earth, Revelation 18, they will weep as they witness their kingdoms crumbling like they're just sinking into the sea. Those who are wealthy, business moguls, the text tells us, that they will mourn as they, they watch their, their investments, their businesses burn up in smoke. Revelation 6 speaks of this day, and, and all will be seeking places of shelter. They'll cry out for the mountains to, to fall upon them and to hide them from the one who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Friends, this will be a day of recompense, a day by which the unjust are given just justice. The wicked, the idolater, and the immoral, they will all drink of the cup of God's wrath as Christ will come and execute judgment upon the world. Brothers and sisters, this horrific description of the great and terrible day of the Lord is to remind us that resistance to the Lord Jesus Christ is futile. It's futile. He, the evil kingdoms and the values of this world, they're all going to come to an end. No matter how strong they may appear or how ferocious they may seem, it is all going down. But not only is it a call for us to realize that resistance to Christ is futile, there is grace here. There's grace because it is also implicit in the warning call to repentance, a call to turn back to the Lord. In fact, God's judgment, his warnings, his, his prophecies, his foretellings of the judgments to come are to serve like the tornado sirens to warn you of the judgment to come so that you may take heed, that you might respond appropriately. This here is as harsh as it may seem. As detailed as it may appear, as, as gruesome as it will be, is intended to be a warning to you and me. It's intended to be a warning to the world. If we were to go back, Joel makes this very clear in Joel chapter 2, verses 12 through 13. It says this, yet even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your hearts and not your garments. He's saying, don't, don't worry about the external appearance of repentance. Actually rip your heart open. Turn to me. Return to the Lord your God for, for why? For he's gracious and he's merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Peter says the day is coming when there will be scoffers who say, where, where is he? Where, where's the appearing of the Lord? And Peter reminds us, he says, do not mistake the patience of the Lord with slackness, laziness, slowness. No, the Lord is patient. Not willing that any would perish, but that all would reach repentance. 
That's why this is here. The coming day of the Lord is a call for everyone to return to the Lord because it is a great day of recompense. But it's also a day of revelation. Let's go back to Mark 13. And particularly in verse 26, we see, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Here, here's another allusion or direct quote now from the prophet Daniel. Daniel 7, 13, where the Son of Man comes. And he'll come with all the power of the Ancient of Days and he will come on the clouds. Acts chapter 1, verse 11, where the risen Christ ascends into the heavens up in the clouds. The, the angels say he will return just as you saw him. So he went in the clouds. He's going to come back on the clouds. And on that day, Revelation 1, 7 says, all the peoples of the earth will see him. And they will wail on account. It's a day of revelation, the great glory of the, of the transfiguration we saw just a couple of chapters back. This glory by which everything of who he is in his divine and human nature is now fully on display. And the text tells us that every eye will see him. Every eye will behold him. And we will see him in all his glory and power. And while this is a day of wailing and mourning for, for those who have have joined forces with this world. For us, friends, this is going to be a moment of exhilaration as our Savior will come to rescue us out of the jaws of the lion's mouth. On that day, we're going to say, yes, he's here. And we're going to be rejoicing as the world is in terror. Our faith is going to become sight. And all the world in a moment is going to know, yep, there's our king. There's our Savior, and guess what? We're his friends. We are the sons of God. We've been adopted into his family. We're co-heirs with Christ. He is here, and he's coming for his bride. So while the world will be weeping and wailing, guess what? Friends, if you're in Christ, this will be a great day of rejoicing. Rejoicing as Jesus is revealed from heaven and his glory shines like the sh brightness of the sun. And his garments will be as white as snow. And his eyes like flames of fire. And his, his feet will be radiating like metal coming out of a furnace. And he'll be coming for us. And when he speaks, there will be no more. Could you say that just a little bit louder? No, his voice will be like the roaring of a waterfall. Roaring of many waters. Friends, do you anticipate this day? Do you long for this day? Is your heart set upon seeing his face, beholding his glory? Have you placed your hope on the world to come? Do you, do you have your mind set on the things above where Christ is seated? Do you find it your prayer and your plead that his kingdom will come and his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven? If not, my friends, you're setting your heart, you're setting your gaze on those things that cannot satisfy and, friends, will not last. And I venture to guess if you've been setting your heart upon the things of this world, you know they haven't satisfied, have they? They never provide what you hope they will. So I appeal to you. As the writer of Hebrews appeals to those saints in those days by saying, we have no lasting city here. And so let us go gladly be put outside with the gate where Christ was crucified. And let us seek the city as the come. The city which when Christ returns, he's going to restore. He's going to restore all things when he's revealed from heaven. Though the day of the Lord will be an awful day for those outside of Christ, for us who know Christ, it will be an all-filled day. 
I will stand and jaws dropped at the sight of our Savior. Jesus goes on, verse 27. We'll see what he'll do. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds and, and the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. This is a comprehensive gathering of God's people. This is worldwide. That's what it's meant to say from the four winds. We, we talk about the four corners of the earth. It's just a way of describing the whole earth. And these angels will gather his people. This is when Christ raptures up his people and gathers us with him. Paul says it this way in 1 Thessalonians 4, at the sound of the trumpet, the dead in Christ will rise first. So those in the grave, the graves will open. Next door is going to be quite the scene, okay? The graves are going to be open. And those who are alive at that time will join them in the air. Paul speaks about this in 1 Corinthians 15. He, he ties it to the resurrection. It's because the graves are going to open. It's the resurrection. And Paul says, notice here, at the last trumpet, we got the trumpet again, will be changed with the twinkling of an eye, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and death will be no more for us. Well, Mark's gospel doesn't record that exact language here. Matthew 24, 3, Matthew records that with a trumpet, the angels will gather. And so we have this connection of themes. So I believe these things are the same event. The return of the Lord, he'll rapture us up. And not only that, at his return, he'll expunge evil and sin and the wicked from this earth. He'll destroy the existing heavens and the earth with fire. Just like in the days of, of Noah, it was a destruction of the world by flood, but this time it'll be a flood of fire that will purify the world. And from the ashes, he will raise up a new creation, a new heavens and a new earth where Satan's sin and death are no more. Amen? No more. And so on this day, Jesus will make every wrong right. And he's going to restore all that has been lost from the fall. Every, everything that death has stolen from us. God and man will dwell together again in perfect bliss, joy, and harmony. And only that which is good, true, and beautiful will remain. It is this day in which the Christian longs for. It's this day in which the Christian waits for. It's this day in which all our hopes are placed. The day in which we are waiting our whole lives. As David in Psalm 27, one thing I have asked that I will seek after that I may dwell in the presence of the Lord to set my gaze upon the beauty of the Lord all the days of my life. That day will be fulfilled when the Lord returns. And so, in that way, we see the day of the Lord is great. And Jesus wants you to know that that day is near. It's near. That's what I want you to see in verse 28. He moves into a parable. He returns to that of a fig tree. And he says this, from the fig tree, verse 28, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. We don't really think about fig trees, although I saw some at the nursery the other day. I was like, oh, there's a fig tree, kids. We've been talking about fig trees. But we think about springtime. Oh, when the flowers begin to bud. We begin to think, oh, spring is near. Well, he's just saying as you can discern the seasons through agriculture, 
So, in the same way, when you see these things occurring, you know that he's near, that he's at the gates, he's at the very doors, kind of the idea. So the question for us are, what are these things? This is kind of a difficult text because in verse 30, he's going to say, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. And disciples are not here. So how, how, do, we, how do we understand these things? The way I understand this is that they are the tribulations, including the destruction of the temple and the signs that Jesus has spoken of from verse 5 through 13. These are the things that will characterize the days between Jesus' first and second coming. And as I argued a couple of weeks ago, the destruction of the temple in AD 70 and in Jerusalem, it is a, it is a type, it is an example is a foreshadowing of the great judgment to come. And so, like the prophecies of old, near and future events are kind of mashed together really tightly. And so they have kind of multiple fulfillments, if you will. And so when you see these things, you see the wars and rumors of wars, you see uh, tornadoes and, and hurricanes and tsunamis, uh, don't be alarmed. These things must take place. But the gospel is going to be proclaimed to the ends of the earth. Even as the church is persecuted and experiences many tribulations, know that when you see these things, I'm near. In what sense is he near? I think what he's talking about here is imminency. Uh, so Jesus is, is talking about these things that, by which he is near i think in the terms of proximity the kingdom is breaking in uh, we, we uh, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand but also in the sense that we are at the last days god's timeline of redemption history we are in the last era if you will and so it is near and so we 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 need to remember again peter has to remind them hey a day for the Lord is, is no different than a thousand days, right? A thousand days is nothing like, a, is, is, is no more than a day. And, and he's not trying to get us to understand, uh, you know, some sense of a formula by which, okay, I can calculate it. He's just using a, a figure of speech to say days, God doesn't experience time like you and I do. In fact, that's one thing that makes him God. He is not part of the creation and does not suffer succession of moments. That doesn't hurt your brain. I don't know what won't, you know? But in God's redemptive plan, the old age is passing away and the new age is coming. In fact, you're a new creation. Already the Holy Spirit, the, the coming powers of the age, now God dwells in you if you know Christ. His Spirit has come and taken residence in you and that was a sign of the age to come. And these things are already happening. It's like in Narnia. When the winter begins to melt and the ice begins to melt and you start seeing flowers and, and they're like, what does this mean? It means that Aslan's on the move. The kingdom is breaking in. And so there's a sense in which he is near, a sense of proximity. He's right at the door. But it also in a sense of timing. He is near. It is soon. The last days are here. I believe that every generation, since the disciples to us, and how many more there may be, can look at the events of the world and say, yep, this is exactly what Jesus said would happen. And he could come in. It could come at any time. That's why every generation thinks it's their generation. I think there's something to that. Because he could come at any moment. I was talking with somebody. I said, wouldn't it be great if he came while I'm preaching this? That'd be just, boom. Way to end a sermon. You don't need me to preach. So in this way, we can trust. And this is what Jesus says, verse 31. Heaven and earth will pass away. What you see right here will pass away. But you know what's not going to pass away? My words, Jesus says. We can rest assured 
that just as all these things, we see them and we can read the signs. Okay, we're in the last days. I don't know how long those last days are going to last, but we're here. And everything exactly as Jesus said is taking place. His words will not pass away. His kingdoms rise and they fall. Generations come and go. His word will remain true. He's kept his promises. And so we can rest assured that his promises will be kept until he brings us safely to himself. So what are we to do in the meantime? In the meantime, we must remain watchful. Because though we can sense its nearness, we will not be able to detect the hour or the day. So that's our last point. The day of the Lord is unexpected. It's unexpected. Jesus says here in verse 36, or 32, excuse me, no one knows not even the, hour, the angels or the, uh, in heaven nor the Son, but the Father only. No one knows that day or that hour. Well, let me have just a little side comment here. We've got some interpretive issues. We had the previous one, this generation. Now we have the fact that the Son doesn't even seem to know when he's going to return. How do we, how do we grapple with that? This passage is, is one of those passages that reminds us that though Jesus is fully divine, he's also fully human. One person, two natures. And Christians have carefully articulated the incarnation to uphold these two truths without nullifying the other. And it's a mystery. We, we can't ultimately unravel these things. And here's an example where Jesus' humanity is being emphasized. In his humanity, he does not know. But that's not to say that in his divine nature, he doesn't know. That would be to separate the triune God. And you can't do that. So even if you don't understand these things, and we could explore them some other time, just hold those two realities in, in tension. All right? the, the divine nature of the Son knows all things. Human nature in this, at this time and moment does not know the day or the hour. But here's the point. Even the Son of Man, Son of David, was not privy to these details. Neither will you, okay? Neither will you. If the angels in heaven don't know, you're not going to figure it out, okay? doesn't matter what book is published or sermon is preached or anything like that they come and go how many i won't you, you don't have to raise your hand we're, pastor phil and i were talking about this uh this week but you know 88 reasons christ will return in 1988 right some of you know that one i've heard about it i was only five so uh sorry and from what i was told is that he said oh i made an error 89 reasons come in 18, 1989. Well, we know how that goes. And that's how it always goes. Yeah, we can look at the events and even things that are happening in the world and say, hey, these things could lead to that and he could come. Yes. But you do not know the day or the hour. You do not know. So, what are we to do? We must be ready. We must be ready. We must be good doomsday preppers, if you will. Okay? We must be ready. How? By being watchful. And, and Jesus explains this with another parable. Verse 33, be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. And what's it going to be like? Well, he gives a, another parable, verse 34. It's like a man going on a journey. This is a master who has a great estate. He says when he leaves home, he puts his servants in charge, each with his work. Notice that. Each are assigned tasks that the master has given them. And then he focuses on one, and he commands the, the doorkeeper to stay awake. So he looks at his disciples. He says, therefore, you stay awake. You stay awake like that doorkeeper. You stay awake like those servants who are always doing what their master told them to do. For you do not know when the master of the house will come. And he gives four different times 
What's consistent here, these are broken up in the Roman uh, four watches of the night. It's four ways to talk about the different times. Here's the thing. No one travels at night. Why? Because it's too dangerous. And the point is, is that each of one of these times is a time you would not expect the master to come. That's the point. No, he'd come in the day. He'd come when you could see it. You'd expect it. But not this master. When Jesus comes, it will be unexpected. Matthew in his gospel says it'll be like the days of Noah. They're marrying and giving into marriage. They were, they were carrying on just like it was yesterday. And then sudden destruction came upon them. Friends, so it'll be. Yes, you can read the signs and say, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But in another sense, it'll be just like today. It'll be, I didn't expect it to happen now, but let's go. It won't be expected. And so Jesus then says, verse 36, he's going to come suddenly and find, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. Be awake, awake, be alert. And then he says, and what I say to you, I say to all. He's saying to you and me, stay awake. So what does it mean to stay awake? What's that metaphor conjuring up? Paul uses it when he talks to the church in Thessalonica. He says this in chapter 5, verse 6. He says, so then let us not sleep. Got this from Jesus. Let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. What's he talking about here? The metaphor of not being asleep speaks of not being unfaithful to what he's assigned to you, each of what he has tasked you, nor giving yourself to immoral living. Those who sleep or are awake, they are, they're at night, they get drunk at night, they live, they live in the darkness is the idea. And why do people live in the darkness? Why do they drink? Why do they, they give themselves to whatever form of debauchery? to numb their senses to the realities of death. Let us eat and let us drink, for tomorrow we what? We die. It's a hopelessness. It's, it's a no nothingness. It's, a, it's, a, it's like an ostrich sticking their head in the sand. La, 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 la. I don't want to hear it. I just want to enjoy my life. It's YOLO, right? You only live once. Most of you don't have a clue what I just said. But anyway. <laughs> it's a life. It's a perspective of living, and it's actually sleeping. It's ignorant to the fact that this world is passing away. It says, don't. Don't be asleep. Instead of sleeping, to look grow, we're to be awake and focused on what Christ has called us to do, called us to be. This is why every Sunday, one of your pastors reminds us, how do we summarize that here at Tulip Grove? We say, we exist to glorify God. How? By making disciples. That's what he tasked us to do, right? And what kind of disciples? Who worship Christ? Who are in covenant community with one another and grow together in the truth of Love and joy of Christ. Friends, that's what Christ has commanded that we do. That's the task that he's given us. And so we live out this mission of what we are to be as the children of God, as the servants of the Lord, as the church of Jesus Christ, and we live this out in the home. So mom and dad, that mundane work day in and day out of making disciples in your home, little ones who will worship him. And then when they worship Christ, they put their faith in Christ, they, they repent of their sins and they are baptized. They join this covenant community and they continue to grow in the truth, love, and joy of Christ. Moms who have given up a, a life or a career to do that, you, you have not wasted your life. 
dads who make that possible, who are patient with their children, who, are, who come and, and, and organize their home in such a way that they can shepherd the flock of their home. You are not wasting your life. You're staying awake. You're not aloof. We do that in, here in the church. And, and those of you who labor Sunday after Sunday teaching Sunday school, whether it's to our senior saints or those of you who are, who are with those little ones, you could maybe come in. Maybe today you're just like, Dude, does it make a difference? Yes, you're staying awake. You're helping us stay awake. You're using your gifts. And then we do that in the world. We, we bear witness to Christ and some of you have been trying to labor and, and build relationships with that coworker or that neighbor or, or that friend or wherever the Lord has you. And you wonder, are my labors in vain? And I want to tell you, no, your labors are not in vain. You're doing exactly what the master told you to do. And friends, that's what it looks like to be awake and to live as children of the light. And so brothers and sisters, you and I, if you are in Christ, you're not children of darkness to be surprised by that day. It's not going to catch you off guard if you're serving him. But we're children of the light who walk in faithfulness and wisdom according to the gospel of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. And so friends, be ready for his coming. It's not about emulating the doomsday preppers that I talked about at the beginning of the sermon. It's not preparing, how can we go to war or something like that. No. It looks like following the example of the saints of old who were faithful. And even though they died, they did what the Lord entrusted to them. Because, friends, we got a resurrection coming. You aren't going to lose. He's going to restore all things when he comes. When he's revealed in all his glory and he's going to make everything right for it will be a day of recompense. And so friends, my appeal to you as we prepare to leave, let us stand firm upon this good news of Christ and his coming, looking forward to his return and remaining faithful to what he has called us to. Do not lose heart, my friends. Do not lose heart. Do not grow weary in doing what is good. He is coming and your labors are not in vain. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we long for the day of your return. And Lord, where we have been numb by this world and we're all susceptible to it, Lord, I pray you would awaken us. You would sober us up. And that we would set our eyes upon your appearing. Lord, if there's anyone here today who has been living aloof, walking in darkness, asleep, Lord, I pray that you would disturb their souls and they would not be able to leave here without being right with you. And Lord, I pray you would give them grace, that you would have given them ears to hear and eyes to see and hearts to receive this word for them. You breathe life into them, and they would awaken to the good news of Christ today. Lord, would you do that work? Not only now, but Lord, would you use us to sound the alarm of the coming judgment, and you would see fit to rescue those trapped in darkness. Lord, do this for your name's sake and your glory, and we pray it to this end. Amen.